trigonometric convexity of multidimensional indicator. And this is based on a joint work with Alexander Makarchan here in the audience, who is the specialist in that area, and he got me interested in that. So uh, let's have this overview of what is done. Uh, the notion of indicator of an analytic function that describes the function's growth along race is a classical notion it was introduced by Fragman and Lindelof in relation with the fragman lindelof maxim principle. Trigonometric convexity is a defining property of the indicator. The indicator satisfies it and a general function satisfying it, there's some function whose indicator now, as far as multivariate cases are considered, there were many people working in that. Rankin, Lilon, Levin, Ivanov, Kisselman, to name a few. Uh, however, an analogous property of trigonometric convexity was not established so far. So what we do is we prove that property of trigonometric convexity for the indicator of multivariate analytic function, the notion introduced by Ivanov. So there are many ways, there are several ways of generalizing that notion to several dimensions. The one by Ivanov, for that one, we could obtain this trigonometric convexity. The results that we obtain are sharp in the sense that it cannot necessarily be made better in the general case. However, sometimes some things happen. And uh, what is interesting, this conference is called operator theory and harmonic analysis. So I tried to fit into harmonic analysis. Uh, we had this first talk by Li Qingpin about the difference between Fourier transform, Laplace transform, Mellin transform. I'm coming from harmonic analysis, so I'm sorry. And uh, like for commercial purposes, I will call it Fourier transform. But again, this is not uh, strict. But uh, if we go into the proof, discussing a multidimensional analog of the inverse Fourier transform in a sector and obtaining estimates on its decay is an important step of our proof. So a uh, decay of Fourier transform gets into that. It doesn't get to all these delicate theorems about the decay of Fourier transform, but something like that is used here. So there is a relation too. So if we talk about this a multivariable harmonic analysis, still, I think there is something interesting uh, that people could get from this talk, even if they absolutely hate multivariate cases. So let's talk about that. So for functions of one complex variable, we think about this indicator. Here it is. It describes its growth uh, over an array starting from zero going to infinity, and there's this logarithmic to take care of this exponential thing. But why exponential? Why do you think of functions of exponential growth? We'll talk about that. And trigonometric convexity is that if you have two angles, alpha 1 and alpha 2, and some angle in between, then the growth uh, along that angle is tempered by the growth uh, of over these two angles. Uh, the notion of indicator in one dimension is an important tool in some methods, for example, of finding uh, maximal analytic continuation of a function. So uh, Polya's theorem is a classic theorem there. Uh, I also picked uh, uh, the, the, uh, the results of Fritz Carlson, not Leonard Carlson, but even earlier, Fritz Carlson. Uh, uh, this is Institute of Mathematics in Armenia, so uh, Noray Arakelian. Uh, and his works are something that motivated us to think it, and the work of Alexander Makarchan that motivates us to think in that direction. So even if you don't like the multidimensional case, let's think about the one-dimensional case. And I picked up this theorem for you, which is known to the specialist, but I believe it should be known to a much, much wider uh, audience. Uh, Polya's indicator theorem. So we think of an entire function of exponential type, it has some tail expansion, and for that function, in accordance with it, we construct a convex set whose support function is determined by f's indicator as follows. Basically, the faster f grows in some direction, the farther that k is. So it's smaller, it's very close to zero when it doesn't grow fast, and farther from zero when it grows fast. So it's just this convex set. 
And then for this F, you consider it's a Borel transform, which in terms of Taylor series, it's described in this way, if F Taylor series is that. And you can restore F from its Borel transform by taking an integral encompassing that convex set K. Moreover, K is the smallest convex set such that G is homomorphic there. Now, what if I, uh, we talk about some physical interpretation? So when we talk about these electrons and masses, I take a, a Dirac mass from start over. I take a Dirac mass, it's gravity unit, unit mass. It generates gravity field. I consider its potential function. It's a harmonic function. We consider it conjugate. We come to analytic functions finally, which has one singularity at some point. Now, if I consider that analytic function, and if I consider its integral over exponential, so Fourier triathlon type thing, I get the function f. The problem would be to restore, say, g from f. So you know f, you don't know g, you don't know its singularities, you want to restore it. At least, I mean, if it's possible, at least you want to know how, how much this g could be analytically continued until it reaches this thing. So up in terms of convex sets, continuing up to a complement of a convex set, Polya's theorem gives you that. Now, if you think about it, if you compare it to, for example, there's a talk of Rafi Karamian. So what they do, they have this messy thing inside the brain, they don't know what it is. They do the x-ray, so they think of cross sections and they average it and they want to restore that thing. That would correspond, so that mathematical program would correspond to tomography. And this one would correspond to electroencephalogram. When you put a cap on your head and you put these uh, things, small things, yes, yes, except for on your head, uh, and you uh, measure the result and you want to restore where this bad uh, thing is. And, uh, of course, one of the motivations to discuss this is that I actually did it. It's very interesting. They glue it to your head because it's very important that they don't go here and there far away. So it's a cap, a spheric cap. It's glued to your head and they measure it. And from there, they want to know where is this uh, source of uh, subnormal uh, gravity or subnormal uh, electric field in that case. So this polyas indicator. So. But when you think about it, it, it has the smell of Fourier transform and so thing. So it has the smell of Pelliwiner serum. You certainly feel it's in the air. In fact, this serum implies Pelliwiner. And this is, a, it, it's written down in a very nice way in a lecture notes of Misha Sodin and friends. So maybe uh, uh, when someone is given uh, like a lectures and uh, tries to prove Pelly winner, maybe someone tries to, to give the polya theorem, which is more like complete, and derive Pelly winner from it. Maybe. Okay, uh, so, uh, so far for that. And then uh, we go to the main result. Uh, somehow there are many, many notations in that. That's the payoff of working with multivariable case. But uh, I can uh, kind of, like, if, I don't know what it means to draw uh, C2, but uh, okay, I will try. So imagine you have uh, a couple of directions. That is, in this variable Z1, you think of argument of Z1 to be some angle alpha 1. And in the variable Z2, you think of it to be some argument alpha 2. So it's a couple of angles. So in C2, uh, you think of the growth of function along a couple of angles if the first angle corresponds to the first variable and the second to the second. Here you have angle, angle in between. There you would have uh, like an um, like a, something like a, 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 um, an ice cone. So angle angles four couple of angles, that's what you need. And you think of some kind of intermediate couple of angles that uh, falls in between that cone part. So if you have this uh, intermediate pair of angles, and if you can control the growth of the function f of two variables over 
any of these couples, there are four couples, you should be able to somehow encompass it, then you could uh, tell something about the growth over this intermediate double angle direction, uh, some constant C1, C2, you see the exponential, C1 before the first variable, C2 before the second variable, and nicely C1, C2 uh, are what they should be if you were wild guessing. So the result is very, very natural. And uh, somehow the trick is that many people would work with uh, functions uh, like um, entire functions, they would start with considering Taylor series right away. So you see function, you write Taylor series. And we didn't do that. We were thinking about their uh, Fourier transform. So that's why it worked. So the proof is, has a lot of notations and things so on. But in a sense, it's like you change the proof from the first sentence, not consider like this way when Borel transform is defined in terms of its Taylor series, but consider it in Fourier transform way, and then you will uh, succeed. Uh, okay, I'm done. Okay, thank you.